So, um, what I wanted to talk about was chartered archaeologist and where we've got to with that. I'll be repeating a little bit of what I said um, this morning for those of you who were there in the opening address, um, but expanding on some of that as well. And I wanted to look a little bit at um, how we got to where we are now, because I think, particularly on the strength of, of, of the earlier speakers, the way that certainly CIFA looks at membership and skills and competence and accrediting professional skills is quite different now um, and has developed quite a lot over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so I'll be talking about all of this stuff um, and hidden in, in, in my, my lovely word cloud that I'm so proud of um, are all the reasons why we talk about, about these things as well. So it's about capacity, it's about diversity, it's about quality and standards and, and accreditation. So, when we're talking about different ways of looking at skills and different ways of measuring competence, we're not trying to devalue the importance of academic knowledge and understanding. I think that's the first thing to say. It's not about setting up competitive systems or saying that one way is better than another. It's about developing a flexibility of entry routes that actually deliver the skills and competence that we want, that employers want, but also that we need as a profession. So it's not just about the commercial imperative for employers to have people who can operate at the level that they want. It's also about being able to deliver the quality and the public benefit that we're, as, as accredited professionals, we're committed to, to developing. And we started talking about this sort of thing a long time ago. So back 15 years ago, um, project to develop national occupational standards for archaeological practice. And for those of you who aren't familiar with, with, with the UK national occupational standards, this is the definition from the UK Commission for Education and Skills website about what they are and what they do. And they exist for a huge range of different occupational areas from all sorts of things like um, philosophy and theology right through to um, car mechanics and, and plumbing. Um, <clears throat> from time to time, um, the UK government decides that it's had enough of national occupational standards and it's not going to use them anymore. And every now and then there's a, a consultation arises and, and there are discussions ongoing at the moment about whether national occupational standards will actually continue in the future. Um, but I think we're very clear that they are incredibly useful. Um, they serve our purposes for defining competence and, and structuring ways to gain competence. And I think even were they to cease to exist, as a, as a, a UK thing, um, uh, a national thing, and it's something that we would want to enshrine within our process and in fact already have, um, and very much enshrined within the Archaeology Training Forum thinking about, about skills and competence. So the National Occupational Standards underpin lots of things. They underpin things like national and Scottish vocational qualifications. Um, they underpin apprenticeship standards that are being developed at the moment. Professional Development Awards, uh, which are small um, unit-based uh, awards that are, have national certification, so exist as qualifications in their own right, but can be developed by different industries um, to provide CPD accreditation or particular training programmes. Um, they can be used to structure employers' graduate training schemes and um, uh, professional development schemes and for, for CPD provision. Um, so. There's something that we um, are very keen on and have been trying to promote for, for a long time um, within, our own, within, within our own systems and structures. We also have CIFA membership grades, um, and Terry mentioned the three, the three levels of, of, of membership that we have, and, and those of you who are um, accredited members of the Institute will be, will be very familiar with this. Um, these are very general statements about what we think archaeologists at different levels um, should be able to achieve the level of competence, the level of responsibility um, that, they, that they have. And they're not, they're not attached to any particular job role, they're not at attached to any particular specialist area, um, they're, they're very general statements. Um, but we have looked at how we measure more specific skills. Um, so by the wonders of the internet and if this works, um, I can take you through to our competence matrix, which, which Ray um, 
Ray showed you earlier, but also to, um, we'll just see if I can see that. Um, So this worked when I tested it at tea break. Yeah. I don't know how visible that is. Um, this is this is the, the tool that our validation committee uses to assess um, applications for for accredited membership of of CIFA. Um, and what, what we've done with that, what our, our special interest groups have done, is to try and translate that into how that might how that might relate to particular specialist areas. So if we go back to the website, we have all these different special specialist matrices, which, um, for example, for fieldwork, um, illustrate the sorts of roles that might be might be um, and the sorts of skills that might be appropriate at different levels um, and we've tried to to um, these these aren't past the formal validation process but what they do try and do is illustrate to um, to applicants where they might fit in that process so they can relate it back to to um, their their own jobs um, and, and roles and we've had um, help from the Society of Museum Archaeologists to create a, a matrix for museum archaeology. We've had a lot of help from um, Babeo for creating an osteo osteology um, matrix. So I won't put any more of them up because they are slightly um, difficult to see at the back. We've also got a statement um, that was um, enshrined into CEPA policy last year about how we define entry-level competence. What, what's, the, what's the difference between a trainee and a professional archaeologist? One starting at the beginning of their career, but how do we, how do we define that, that, that barrier? Um, and so we have this, this statement which relates that back to our practitioner grade of membership um, and makes it very clear that anybody who hasn't yet achieved that level of competence is a trainee and should be on some sort of training scheme whether that's um, provided by an academic institution, whether it's provided by an employer, whether it's an apprenticeship or an MVQ, they should be in some kind of recognised training role. Because otherwise, how else are they going to get those skills and develop that knowledge to become uh, an accredited member, a practitioner level member? And we expect our registered organisations to have training plans in place, and if they are taking on people who are trainees, to have plans in place for how they will develop that competence and bring those people up to practitioner level membership and support them to become uh, fully accredited professional archaeologists. So, for those of you who were, who were in the opening address this morning, you'll have seen this before. The vision is that we ought to have flexible entry routes to become an archaeologist. So we've been very heavily reliant on graduate entry up to now for all sorts of reasons and largely historical um, and largely due to a lack of, of, of alternatives. In recent years, we know that in going back 10, 15, 20 years, we, a lot of people came into professional archaeology by being volunteers and by developing the skills on the job and that was a recognised entry route in and over the years we've, we've lost that and there are mechanisms now in place to try and regain it but in a structured way so that we know that when those people come in we know what skills we want them to develop, we know that how they're going to develop those skills and we know how to accredit it at the end of that. So we're looking at um, academic study um, accredited by CIFA, uh, something that the RPA already does in, in terms of uh, accrediting um, modules and programmes, academic programmes, um, and that's something that we're discussing with the University of Archaeology UK. The Trailblazer Apprenticeship Initiative that's being led by Historic England is already well advanced in England. There are similar um, frameworks in, in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, which are, are waiting for that first tranche of, of English trailblazers to be approved so that we can translate that into, into the relevant frameworks in the rest of the UK. Um, graduate or career entry training schemes run by employers. There are a small number around at the moment. Um, I imagine that the numbers will increase over the next few years as employers are looking 
to bring more um, people in, to attract more staff into their organisations and for the purposes of um, the CSCS scheme in, in, in the UK, the, the Construction Safety Certification Scheme, we have a, a mechanism for approving employer um, graduate or career entry training schemes so that those graduates can be recognised as being on a formal traineeship programme um, eligible for, for CSCS cards under that, that programme. And I've got copies of, of that if you're interested um, at the front here. Um, and as I said this morning, looking also at those, those flexible entry routes, there's options for self-directed programmes of work experience. Um, archaeology in the UK has a, a, a quite a high um, level of career changes, um, people coming from other, other careers thinking that a change of direction <coughs> might, be, might be good and useful and looking to gain some knowledge and some skills um, across a, 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 a potentially taking a hobby into a into a, um, a paid work um, and we need to, to have systems in place that allows, allows that to happen. All of, these, all of these mechanisms are underpinned by national occupational standards and because we have that link back from our, the national occupational standards to our grades of membership, they can all be accredited through, um, through CIFA membership. So they can all lead to professional status and I think that's, that's the, 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 important, the important point. So along with the, um, the academic programmes and future employer training schemes, we can also provide accreditation and endorsement for training excavations and field schools um, and for CPD courses and workshops. We do that already for the workshops that we provide ourselves, either directly um, from CIFA staff or from the, our volunteers in the, the special interest groups, but also from external providers as well. Um, field schools is a relative, relatively new um, Process and I think we only have one um, CIFA accredited field school at the moment, uh, which is run by Dig Ventures. But we would be very keen um, for organisations, whether that's through university organisations or um, commercial providers, um, to to accredit more um, and to, to be able to develop that that side of of, of the vision. <coughs> So the next step, where is this all taking us? The next step, really, is, is chartered archaeologist. Um, it's the, 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 logical, the logical progression um, as we try and develop these, these um, ideas about skills and competence and about professional recognition. And I think, certainly in the UK, the, 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 the ultimate level of professional recognition, really, is, is, is chartered status. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, with, with what a, a royal charter means. I've, I've nicked this paragraph from Wikipedia in, in good research tradition. Um, but it does, it does sum it up um, um, quite nicely in that it is a mark of professional competency. It's not necessarily about seniority. It's not necessarily about academic achievement. It's about professional competency. And it's a kind mark that's recognised in the UK and certainly by the, the professions that archaeologists work alongside most commonly, um, certainly in a construction environment anyway, so the engineers and the surveyors and the architects and, and the planners. It is also used outside of the UK um, to varying degrees, so for example the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors has a vast global network of chartered surveyors operating across pretty much every, every country um, uh, that that has surveyors. Um, we spoke recently, or fairly recently, as part of our, our charter consultations with the Institute of Textiles, and actually the majority of their chartered members are overseas. Um, in the textile, big textile producing areas like India and Southeast Asia, they have a huge number of, of charter, chartered textile professionals or chartered textile technicians, and relatively few of their members are actually UK based. So it does have some currency as a status outside outside of the UK. It has a particular set of rules around it as well. A chartered status is a, is a, it's a protected title, so were we to um, be able to uh, award chartered archaeologist status in the future, that's a protected title. Anybody can call themselves an archaeologist, but only people who've been granted chartered status from CIFA would be able to call themselves a chartered, architect, uh, chartered archaeologist. Um, and that's protected in law. It also means that the standards for becoming a chartered archaeologist are agreed between 
the professional body and government, the Privy Council office, and they can't be changed without permission. So it's it's binding in that sense. We're, we're in some ways no longer masters of our own destiny at that point because we have to go through the Privy Council office if we want to make changes. Um, and, and many charter statuses are also protected titles under European um, rules as well. Uh, I don't know how that relates, Ray, to what you were saying this morning about recognition of qualifications and the extent to which chartered status would be recognised um, more so perhaps than member. That that would be something that we'll need to, to investigate a bit more. No, that's I think. an interesting question because, I mean, since, since archaeology is not a regulated profession in most European countries, it's unlikely that the professional qualification directives apply. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, it, it is possible mm -hmm. and we'll need to investigate yeah. that, I, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly an area for, for further dialogue, I think. There's been a, um, a Choose Chartered campaign. It's been quite interesting. I don't know if you've come across this at all, but uh, certainly on my, my regular train journeys, I keep seeing posters on, on, on the train walls for Choose Chartered, and it, one, one week it'll be surveyors or engineers, and then it might be insurance brokers or, or accountants. Um, and I just wanted to show you, if you'll bear with me, this, if it works, this, this little clip. Um, I'm doing a bit of free advertising for a company that I think offers all kinds of financial and insurance advice. Um, so ignore that. I'm not paid by them at all. completely different world from the one that we inhabit but it struck me when I looked at that how many times they've flashed up professional ethical competent um, trusted and those are exactly the words that we use um, all the time to try and describe what being an accredited professional means and what being a member of CIFA means um, and Surveys, uh, the, the, the one that we always quote was undertaken by one of the insurance um, professional bodies for, for the insurance industry, um, that showed that the public rank chartered status above other academic qualifications or fellowship of societies or, or, or any of those other, other designations, um, when it comes to trust, um, it's perceived as being a, a kite mark of quality and it's recognised. And I think that's, that's been the big attraction really for us as, as archaeologists is thinking about mechanisms to, to achieve that, that parity of recognition, um, parity of esteem alongside um, the fellow professionals that, that we work with. So in terms of developing chartered archaeologist status, we've been, we've been consulting over the last um, 18 months or so really, talking to colleagues, talking amongst ourselves with our advisory council, 
um, and, and other stakeholders about what what this would mean. As I say, if we if we seek to amend our Royal Charter, once that's done, if we get the permission to do that, any changes would have to go back to the Privy Council Office. So it's very important that we get this right and that we make sure we know exactly what we want um, and how we want to achieve it before we, before we submit that. Um, so we're looking at um, the creation of career development pathways. That's something I was talking about this morning very briefly, about bringing together the resources that we already have developed on the website so they're easily accessible. Um, and so we're not just looking at a bolt on to an existing system, but we're looking at improving the pathways to membership, to charter <coughs> status, to professional accreditation for all aspiring um, professional archaeologists so that it's as relevant for somebody who's looking to upgrade their membership from a student to a practitioner as it is for somebody who's looking to, to apply for, for chartered status there and then. We need obviously the support of the sector to, to do this. Um, chartered status of itself doesn't actually change anything, it's another title. Um, it's a protected title, but unless we uh, we recognise the value of that of that status, it won't really do very much for the status of archaeologists at all. So we have to have faith, and I say we stakeholders, curators, national agencies, the people that we work alongside. If we're not convinced that this is a a, a useful and a reliable and transparent, um, robust system, then um, we're not really going to convince anybody else. So we're looking at how we currently assess competence, um, technical competence we assess through the validation system against the matrices that we spoke about earlier um, and that's a well established system. What we need to look at is how we assess ethical competence and how we support members in developing that ethical competence um, to understand, as, as Terry and Chris said earlier, the, the legal and ethical frameworks that, that we operate in and a lot of graduates coming out of university don't really understand that system, they don't understand where in a spatial planning process particular things happen, they don't necessarily understand who the end customer is, they don't necessarily really understand what the public benefit is, what the, what the, the, the big goal, the big, the big story at the end of, of their particular piece of work um, is all about and we, do, we need to support them to, to gain that knowledge. Um, we also need to look then at the tools that we have to support people through that. So a lot of ch chartered um, institutes who are able to confer chartered status on their members will have an on usually online pathway, you sign up, there are resources, there are particular points um, along that pathway where you are assessed and where you can receive feedback. Um, mentoring is, is an important part in a lot of cases and that's something that we're looking at um, whether we can develop something that would help to, to mentor, where we can assign um, applicants to a mentor to help them through that process. How we put portfolios together, whether that's something that's a physical um, collection of work, whether it's an online portfolio, whether there are, there are plenty of electronic systems out there that allow you to gather um, CPD records and um, to, to collect evidence of your, of your work. Um, how we go about doing that and also whether then the end point is a professional review and that would that would be something new for us where we can bring appl applicants in and test their ethical competence where they can discuss in front of a panel um, particular issues um, to in order to, to to mark the difference I think between chartered archaeologists and the existing member grades but all of these obviously have resource implications um, they need to be administered we need to find people who will act as mentors, who will act as reviewers um, in those situations. We need to think about whether those are volunteers and how we support those volunteers if they are. So there's a lot of detail at the moment that needs, that needs drafting out and that's what we're going to be doing over the next two or three months. Um, in terms of how it, might, how it relates to our existing member grades, again, I put this up briefly this morning. Um, we've looked at various different options um, including throwing the whole lot out and starting again from scratch um, and I think this is certainly this is our, our preferred option at the moment that might change when we discuss in more detail 
um, with, with colleagues and, and stakeholders. But we see chartered archaeologists as sitting alongside the current system at the moment, but probably over time replacing the member grade. Um, and that's probably because, A, it starts to get very complicated in terms of terminology, because if you have chartered members and then you have members of a chartered institute who aren't actually chartered, and um, if you have to write an essay to explain exactly what your professional <laughs> qualification is, that's, that's going to be counterproductive. Um, I also like the idea that, that people at career entry stage can see a clear pathway so they don't have to think, well, I've got to go here and I've got to go there and I've got to go there and then I can be chartered archaeologist. They can join the pathway at the practitioner level and they can develop their skills and their competence and when they're ready and they have the necessary level of competence, they can apply direct <coughs> for chartered status if, if, if they, they want to. Um, again, that's something that, that, that we'll need to get more feedback on, but that's, that's the, current, the current thinking. And we're looking at taking this as an outline to the AGM in October this year. So we would have aim to have a draft proposal for members to, to, to vote on um, to either approve or disapprove uh, the detailed legal drafting stage that we need to go through to amend, to amend the Charter. If that is approved, we would take the formal petition for approval at the 2018 um, AGM. If it's not, and the message from the members is that we need to go away and think, start again, think again, um, then obviously that will, that will take a bit longer. Um, and that just explains um, a little bit more about, about how we see that fitting, fitting into the, the current system and particularly the emphasis on understanding the broader historic environment context in which people work. Um, legal frameworks, ethical frameworks, and, and testing that, that, that ethical um, knowledge through, through some sort of structured mechanism. So those were the words that flashed up a lot during the, the little video clip. Um, this is the goal. Um, it's the important, they're all important words, the, but the two most important for us, I think, are accredited and recognised. Um, the vast majority, um, one would hope, of archaeologists working in the UK are ethical and competent, but we have no means of judging that if they're not also accredited and recognised, um, and that's, that's what we want to achieve. Just to pose a few questions then for, for, for the, the, the second half of this, this session in terms of discussion, um, obviously for more established professions like the chartered surveyors, chartered status has uh, a global, there is a global demand. Um, in terms of the tools that we've developed and, and chartered status, what would be interesting to consider is how transferable that is, whether it does make, have any relevance at all outside the UK, it may not, um, it's, it's an open question. Um, whether it's useful, whether it's, you feel it's appropriate, um, unattractive, and um, whether there's anything in there that provides some kind of mechanism for accrediting skills on a global scale, for allowing archaeologists to be able to move freely across borders in terms of, of, of their skills, um, and even whether that's, whether that's necessary, whether you feel that that's something that, that CIFA should be looking at. It certainly some figures quite highly in the various Brexit discussions that we've been having. Um, that it's probably from a, a very much from a UK perspective at the moment because of the demand that we're anticipating for our archaeologists. And if we can't draw those archaeologists in from Europe, um, as well as growing our own um, talent uh, uh, here in the UK, then that poses extra challenges for us. Um, a lot of the lobbying work that, that, that colleagues do, uh, Pete and, and Tim do, in terms of, of, of Brexit, has looked at. Um, the movement of accredited professionals and whether that is a mechanism um, that we that we might use. But I just thought I'd pose those questions up there to, to perhaps get us started in, in terms of debate. Thank you.